Deanne Arbus was my mother, which means that the way in which I knew her was in terms of a, a kind of familiarity that I took for granted, uh, as you have to if you live with somebody. Um, the way I knew her photographs, I mean, some of them still to me, I remember as, as torn pieces of, of paper that she would bring, bring back from the darkroom. I remember them tacked on walls, you know, around her bed or on this wooden screen she had in one place we lived. And I had an enormous sense that, that photography was a kind of secret of hers. I don't mean that the process was secret or that, or that she was secretive about it, because she really loved to, to, to tell about it. And she loved to tell about sort of where she'd gone and who she'd been with. And, uh, but that something about what happened when she was there uh, was a secret. I think it may have something to do with uh, the way in which she grew up. She grew up in New York, uh, mostly on Central Park West. And her father owned Russick's, which was this huge Fifth Avenue department store. And there was a sense about her whole childhood and again, I mean, as I heard it from her, it sort of filtered in so that now I don't know, I really feel like I knew it. I mean, I used to feel as a kid like I'd been there. There was an enormous sense of what was prohibited. Uh, and I think that photographing for her had enormously to do with being able to discover that prohibitions didn't apply. In July 1971, my mother committed suicide. And shortly after that, Marvin Israel, a very close friend of hers and I, felt that we wanted to do a book of her work together. So we began collecting not just the pictures, but sort of whatever material we could find. In 1970, she had given a class in Westbeth, which was where she lived. And we found out that one of the students in that class was a Japanese photographer named Iko Narahara, who admired Deanne's work enormously. Uh, the problem was that he barely spoke any English at all. So what he had done was to go to the classes and bring along a tape recorder to record everything that was said so that afterwards he could go home and see if he could try and understand it. Um, so he lent us those tapes. The tapes were of very poor quality, so we asked Mary Claire Costello, who was a friend of Deanne's, to read Deanne's own words over glimpses of Deanne's photographs. My favorite thing is to go where I've never been. For me, there's something just about going into somebody else's house. When it comes time to go, if I have to take a bus to somewhere or if I have to take a cab uptown, it's like I've got a blind date, in a sense. It's always seemed something like that to me. And sometimes I have a sinking feeling of, oh, God, it's time, and I really don't want to go. And then once I'm on my way, something terrific takes over about the sort of queasiness of it and how there's absolutely no method for control. If I were just curious, it would be very hard to say to someone, I want to come to your house and have you talk to me and tell me the story of your life. I mean, people are going to say you're crazy. Plus, they're going to keep mighty guarded. But the camera is a kind of license. And for a lot of people, they want to be paid that much attention. And that's a reasonable kind of attention to be paid. Actually, they tend to like me. I'm extremely likable with them. I think I'm kind of two-faced. 
I'm very ingratiating. It really kind of annoys me. I'm just sort of a little too nice. Everything is, oh. And I hear myself saying, how terrific. And here's this woman making a face. I really mean it's terrific. I don't mean I wish I looked like that. I don't mean I wish my children looked like that. I don't mean in my private life I want to kiss you, but I mean that's amazingly, undeniably something. There are always two things that happen. One is recognition, and the other is that it's totally peculiar. But there's some sense in which I always identify with them. Everybody has that thing where they need to look one way, but they come out looking another way. And that's what people observe. You see somebody on the street, and essentially what you notice about them is the flaw. It's just extraordinary that we should have been given these peculiarities and not content with what we were given, we create a whole other set. Our whole guise is like giving a sign to the world to think of us in a certain way. But there's a point between what you want people to know about you and what you can't help people knowing about you. And that has to do with what I've always called the gap between intention and effect. I mean, if you scrutinize reality closely enough, if in some way you really, really get to it, it becomes fantastic. You know, it really is totally fantastic that we look like this, and you sometimes see that very clearly in a photograph. Something is ironic in the world, and it has to do with the fact that what you intend never comes out like you intend it. What I'm trying to describe is that it's impossible to get out of your skin into somebody else's. And that's what all this is a little bit about, that somebody else's tragedy is not the same as your own. Another thing is a photograph has to be specific. I remember a long time ago when I first began to photograph, I thought there are an awful lot of people in the world and it's going to be terribly hard to photograph all of them. So if I photograph some kind of generalized human being, everybody will recognize it. It'll be like what they used to call the common man or something like that. It was my teacher, Lisette Modell, who finally made it clear to me that the more specific you are, the more general it'll be. You really have to face that thing. And there are certain evasions, certain nicenesses that I think you have to get out of. The process itself has a kind of exactitude, a kind of scrutiny that we're not normally subject to. I mean, that we don't subject each other to. We're nicer to each other than the intervention of the camera is going to make us. It's a little bit cold, a little bit harsh. Now, I don't mean to say that all photographs have to be mean. Sometimes they show something really nicer, in fact, than what you felt, or oddly different. But in a way, this scrutiny has to do with not evading facts, not evading what it really looks like. Freaks was a thing I photographed a lot. It was one of the first things I photographed, and it had a terrific kind of excitement for me. I just used to adore them. I still do adore some of them. I don't quite mean they're my best friends, but they made me feel a mixture of shame and awe. There's a quality of legend about freaks, like a person in a fairy tale who stops you and demands that you answer a riddle. I mean, if you've ever spoken to someone with two heads, you know they know something you don't. Most people go through life dreading they'll have a traumatic experience. Freaks were born with their trauma. They've already passed their test in life. They're aristocrats. I'm very little drawn to photographing people that are known, or even subjects that are known. They fascinate me when I've barely heard of them, and the minute they get public, I become terribly blank about them. From the beginning, she started to photograph completely differently from other people. But this difference was a difference she wanted. It was a preconceived difference to be, by all means and by, under all circumstances, original and unique. And then it had to be explained to her that there are great artists in every era who are so new and so different 
that nobody can understand them. The ears or the eyes are not used to it. And they may be the ones who really contribute to the medium. But at the same time, there are other artists and they work also in a non-understandable kind of a way. Nobody could understand what they are doing. And they are phonies, and they work with illusions and fantasies. And that this kind of a difference is extremely important to understand. So Diane said to me, you know, she said, I went to the School of Cultural Ethical Culture, where a child, whatever a child did, was considered the work of a genius. So I had never an occasion to find out what's good, what's bad, what's truth, and what's false. And from that moment on, Diane did not bring any more of these pictures. And she started in another way. She had an enormous, different kind of wide subject matter range. And besides the subject matter, she had unusual things. She had also her specific subject matter, which of course was the most important which was to photograph freaks, homosexuals, lesbians, cripples, sick people, dying people, dead people. But she did it very differently from other people. You see, most people look away when they see this subject matter, whereas Diane did not look away. And that takes courage and independence. And I think it is the first time as far as I know, in history of photography, that somebody would photograph this kind of people who are discriminated and we are afraid to look at them because deep down in ourselves we feel we are still crippled somewhere, even if it isn't outside. And she photographed them humanly, seriously, and functioning in their lives. And that was an extraordinary kind of an achievement. She said once to me she wanted to have stillness in her photographs. And she posed everybody, either in the streets or in their homes, and let them look directly at her or into the camera. And by doing so, one would have meant, uh, believed that that would freeze the picture. But it was just the opposite, her influence upon these people and their reaction to her made the picture as spontaneous as if it were not posed. That was a great contribution. One of the things I felt I suffered from as a kid was I never felt adversity. I was confirmed in a sense of unreality which I could only feel as unreality. And that sense of being immune was ludicrous as it seems, a painful one. It was as if I didn't inherit my own kingdom for a long time. The world seemed to me to belong to the world. I could learn things, but they never seemed to be my own experience. I wasn't a child with tremendous yearnings. I didn't worship heroes. I didn't long to play the piano or anything. I did paint, but I hated painting and I quit right after high school because I was continually told how terrific I was. It was like self-expression time and I was in a private school and their tendency was to say, what would you like to do? And then you did something and they said, how terrific. <laughs> it made me feel shaky. I remember I hated the smell of the paint and the noise it would make when I put my brush to the paper. Sometimes I would not really look but just listen to this horrible sort of squish, squish, squish. I didn't want to be told I was terrific. I had a sense that if I was so terrific at it, it wasn't worth doing. I like to put things up around my bed all the time, pictures of mine that I like and other things, and I change it every month or so. There's some funny subliminal thing that happens. It isn't just looking at it. It's looking at it when you're not looking at it. It really begins to act on you in a funny way. I suppose a lot of these observations are bound to be after the fact. I mean, there's nothing you can do to yourself to get yourself to work. You can't make yourself work by putting up something beautiful on the wall or by knowing yourself. Very often, knowing yourself isn't really going to lead you anywhere. Sometimes it's going to leave you kind of blank. 
Like, here I am, there's a me, I've got a history, I've got things that are mysterious to me in the world, and I've got things that bug me in the world, but there are moments when all of that doesn't seem to avail. Each photograph for Diane was an event, and it could be said, although it could be argued, that for Diane the most valuable thing wasn't the photograph itself, the art object. It was the event, the experience. I mean, she was absolutely moved by every single event that took place, and she would narrate them in detail. And she wouldn't just say, I took a photograph of so-and-so in their home. But it was the going there, the being there, the dialogue that came back and forth, the, the moments of even just waiting and, and no, no talk. It was an incredibly personal thing. And once, you've, once you become an adventurer, because Deanne was really an adventurer, she went places that no one had ever gone to. They were scary. And once you have become an adventurer, you're geared to adventure, you seek out further adventures, and your life is really based upon them. And uh, I've, I've said that the photograph is like her trophy. It's what she received as the reward for this adventure, just like some guy climbs Mount Everest, you know, and he has a flag in his hand. And he, you see him there, Deanne has the photograph. I used to have a theory about photographing it was a sense of getting in between two actions, or in between action and repose. I don't mean to make a big deal of it. It was just like an expression I didn't see or wouldn't have seen. One of the excitements of Strobe at one time was that you were essentially blind at the moment you took the picture. I mean, it alters light enormously and reveals things you don't see. In fact, that's what made me really sick of it. I began to miss light like it really is. And now I'm trying to get back to some kind of obscurity, where at least there's normal obscurity. Lately, I've been struck with how I really love what you can't see in a photograph, an actual physical darkness. It's very thrilling for me to see darkness again. What's thrilling to me about what's called technique, I hate to call it that because it sounds like something up your sleeve, but what moves me about it is that it comes from some mysterious, deep place. I mean, it can have something to do with the paper and the developer and all that stuff, but it comes mostly from some very deep choices somebody has made that take a long time and keep haunting them. Invention is mostly this kind of subtle, inevitable thing. People get closer to the beauty of their invention. They get narrower and more particular in it. Invention has a lot to do with a certain kind of light some people have and with the print quality and the choice of subject. It's a million choices you make. It's luck, in a sense, or even ill luck. Some people hate a kind of complexity. Others only want that complexity. But none of that is really intentional. I mean, it comes from your nature, your identity. We've all got an identity. You can't avoid it. It's what's left when you take everything else away. I think the camera is something of a nuisance in a way. It's recalcitrant. It's determined to do one thing and you may want it to do something else. And you have to fuse what you want and what the camera wants. It's like a horse. Well, that's a bad comparison because I'm not much of a horseback rider. But I mean, you get to learn what it will do. I've worked with a couple of them. One will be terrific in certain situations, or I can make it be terrific. Another will be very dumb, but sometimes I kind of like that dumbness. It'll do, you know. I get a great sense that they're different from me. I don't feel that total identity with the machine. I mean, I can work it fine, although I'm not so great, actually. Sometimes when I'm winding it, It'll get stuck or something will go wrong and I just start clicking everything and suddenly very often it's all right again. That's my feeling about machines. If you sort of look the other way, they'll get fixed, except for certain ones.
Very often when you go to photograph, it's like you're going for an event. Say it's a beauty contest. You picture it in your mind a little bit that there will be these people who will be the judges and they'll be choosing the winner from all these contestants. And then you go there and it's not like that at all. Very often an event happens scattered and the account of it will look to you in your mind like it's going to be very straight and photographable. But actually one person is over there and another person is over here and they don't get together. Even when you go to do a family, you want to show the whole family. But how often are the mother and father and the two kids all on the same side of the room? unless you tell them to go there. I work from awkwardness. By that I mean I don't like to arrange things. If I stand in front of something, instead of arranging it, I arrange myself. I remember one summer I worked a lot in Washington Square Park. It must have been about 1966. And the park was divided. It had these walks, sort of like a sunburst, and there were these territories staked out. There were young hippie junkies down one row. There were lesbians down another, really tough, amazingly hardcore lesbians. And in the middle were winos. They were like the first echelon. And the girls who came from the Bronx to become hippies would have to sleep with the winos to get to sit on the other part with the junkie hippies. It was really remarkable. And I found it very scary. I mean, I could become a million things, but I could never become that, whatever all those people were. There were days I just couldn't do it, and then there were days I could, and then having done it a little, I could do it more. I got to know a few of them. I hung around a lot. They were very much like sculptures in a funny way. I was very keen to get very close to them, so I had to ask to photograph them. You can't get that close to somebody and not say a word, although I have done that. I have this funny thing, which is that I'm never afraid when I'm looking in the ground glass. This person could be approaching with a gun or something like that, and I'd have my eyes glued to the finder, and it wasn't like I was really vulnerable. It just seemed terrific what was happening. I mean, I'm sure there are limits. God knows when the troops start advancing on me, you do approach that stricken feeling where you perfectly can get killed. But there's a kind of power thing about the camera. I mean, everyone knows you've got some edge. You're carrying some slight magic which does something to them. It fixes them in a way. I used to think I was shy, and I got incredibly persistent in the shyness. I remember enjoying enormously the situation of being put off and having to wait. I still do. I suppose I use the waiting time for a kind of nervousness, for getting calm or, I don't know, just waiting. It isn't such a productive time. It's a really boring time. I remember once I went to this female impersonator club and I waited about four hours and then I couldn't photograph and they told me to come back another night. But somehow I learned to like that experience because while being bored, I was also entranced. I mean, it was boring, but it was also mysterious. People would pass. And also I had a sense of what there was to photograph that I couldn't actually photograph, which I think is quite enjoyable sometimes. The Chinese have a theory that you pass through boredom into fascination, and I think it's true. I would never choose a subject for what it means to me or what I think about it. You just choose a subject and what you feel about it, what it means, begins to unfold if you just plain choose a subject and do it enough. So much of photography has been concerned, perhaps especially in recent decades, with making the photograph look good, almost with a kind of visual athletics, perhaps. Uh, with formal games that can be played so well and so enchantingly and fascinatingly with photography or with more peripheral problems uh, such as how to make photography look like other fine arts. Diane knew that Edward Steigen said once that photography was born perfect. 
And Diane knew that. She knew that at its absolutely simplest, most primitive, most direct and unembellished way, the, the problem for the photographer was simply to understand absolutely and with precision and with uh, sensitivity and with complete clarity what it was that was out there that you were looking at and what were the, what were the secret meanings that, that exist wherever, wherever one looks, if one looks with enough intelligence and enough wit and enough precise enough intuitions. The, the influence that she's had has been simply enormous because it looked when all of us, when we first looked at Diane's pictures, it was almost as though, almost as though we were starting again, as though we were back in the days of the daguerreotype, or back in the days of Matthew Brady. And it was, it was, it was a new, fresh, unused medium again. All the all the fanciness had been stripped away, and all that was left was the marvelous, clear airless uh, experience of life, absolutely without any interposition of, of concern for effect or concern for, in a sense, any concern for art. That's a, of course, that's, a, that's not really true. She was always an artist and she knew she was an artist. Her way of being an artist, you know, was, was to conceal that fact as, as fully as she could from, from us when we looked at the pictures. The thing that's important to know is that you never know. You're always sort of feeling your way. One thing that struck me very early is that you don't put into a photograph what's going to come out, or vice versa. What comes out is not what you put in. I never have taken a photograph I've intended. They're always better or worse. For me, the subject of the picture is always more important than the picture and more complicated. I do have a feeling for the print, but I don't have a holy feeling for it. I really think what it is is what it's about. I mean, it has to be of something, and what it's of is always more remarkable than what it is. I do feel I have some slight corner on something about the quality of things. I mean, it's very subtle and a little embarrassing to me, but I really believe there are things which nobody would see unless I photographed them. Diane Arbus was my mother, which means that the way in which I knew her was in terms of a, a kind of familiarity that I took for granted. I mean, I used to feel as a kid like I'd been there. There was an enormous sense of what was prohibited. Uh, 
And I think that photographing for her had enormously to do with being able to discover that prohibitions didn't apply. In July 1971, my mother committed suicide. And shortly after that, Marvin Israel, a very close friend of hers and I, felt that we wanted to do a book of her work together. So we began collecting not just the pictures, but sort of whatever material we could find. In 19th, love to tell about sort of where she'd gone and who she'd been with. And, uh, but that something about what happened when she was there uh, was a secret. I think it may have something to do with uh, the way in which she grew up. She grew up in New York, uh, mostly on Central Park West. And her father owned Russick's, which was this huge Fifth Avenue department store. And there was a sense about her whole childhood and again, I mean, as I heard it from her, it sort of filtered in so that now I don't know, I really feel like I knew it. I mean, 70, she had given a class in West Beth, which was where she lived. And we found out that one of the students in that class was a Japanese photographer named Iko Narahara, who admired Deanne's work enormously. Uh, the problem was that he barely spoke any English at all. So what he had done was to go to the classes and bring along a tape recorder to record everything that was said so that afterwards he could go home and see if he could try and understand it. Um, so he lent us those tapes. The tapes were of very poor quality, so we asked Mary Claire Costello, who was a friend of Deanne's, to read Deanne's own words over glimpses of Deanne's photographs. My favorite thing. Uh, as you have to, if you live with somebody. Um, the way I knew her photographs, I mean, some of them still to me, I remember as, as torn pieces of, of paper that she would bring, bring back from the darkroom. I remember them tacked on walls, you know, around her bed or on this wooden screen she had in one place we lived. And I had an enormous sense that, that photography was a kind of secret of hers. I don't mean that the process was secret or that, or that she was secretive about it, because she really loved to, to, to tell about it. And she 